welcome back to our series, The Calm Before the Storm. Before we open God's word together, let's bow our heads in prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that we have to be able to study together. And we thank you, Lord, that even in times of distress and trial, that we feel your presence with us. And so we ask that you would continue to guide us, not because we're worthy, but because we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. As we're considering the words that we have been studying, we sometimes realize that the faith that we have in God's word sets us apart from those who want to put that faith aside. The Apostle Paul writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12 says, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. The apostle here gives the warning, the instruction, and also the encouragement to the young minister, saying that the day is coming when he will see his Savior in person, and he needs to persevere to that day. That day in prophecy is most clearly defined in the book of Revelation, and it's in the book of Revelation that we find most clearly a description not simply of prophetic events, but of the events that show Jesus Christ. That's why the book of Revelation begins with those words in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant, John. We're looking at the book of Revelation, not simply to understand prophecy, but because it's our desire to know our Savior more. And this book of scripture is a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you and me, it gives us an encouragement of the things which will come and a knowledge that even in distress, the Lord is with us. That's why the Lord himself, in Luke chapter 21 and verse 28, it says, And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. These things were recorded so that you and I would be able to discern the signs of the times and know that the coming of our Lord and Savior is very, very soon. We can then comprehend the signs of the times taking place around us and look at our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I myself this week had to deal with an issue of the environment that we were talking about last week. We've had fires in California, but none of those fires have really been close to me. This week, we got the phone call. Guess what? You need to evacuate. There is a fire taking place right at the next property to ours. It was amazing to try to wrap my head around the fact that I could lose everything, or so I thought. But in that moment, I actually had to think about what was important. So I turned to my wife, I turned to my daughter. We're trying to figure out which things we're going to take away now that we have to evacuate from our home. Thank God the fire was put out in a short amount of time. We had great firefighters and heroes that came there and assisted to put that fire out. And it started to spread in the direction away from where we live. And that was fortunate for us, thank God, no lives were lost. But in that moment, you think what is actually important to you? That's what the signs of the times do. They allow us to determine what actually is important to us. When looking then at these prophecies, specifically to the prophecy in Revelation chapter 13, we find here that there are events that are taking place in the earth that we have to pay attention to. This second beast of Revelation 13, which has been the focus of our study, is a nation. Revelation chapter 13 verse 11 says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. 
As we looked at this verse, we were able to see in our first study that a beast is a nation, that coming up out of the earth meant that it was a new land. And we were also able to see that the horns were powers or principles by which it was governed. If you haven't seen that, take a look at the first video in the series to be able to see the proofs for those points. When we looked at these things, there was only one nation that fit that, and that was the United States of America. This nation guaranteed certain rights and liberties from the very beginning of its founding. The Declaration of Independence stated that these rights were given by God. The Constitution enshrined the principles that this was a Protestant and Republican nation. And the Bill of Rights passed in 1791 ensured that religious liberty would be part of the fabric of this nation. But these rights are slipping away. And the way that we know that they're slipping away is not in the way that you would think, but in a way that is very, very subtle and yet has great impact and power. In early writings on page 86, it says that at that time, this is the time while Christ is in the sanctuary, while the work of salvation is closing, trouble will be coming on the earth and the nations will be angry yet held in check so as not to prevent the work of the third angel. What's this third angel? What work is the third angel doing? It's making a proclamation. In Revelation chapter 14, right after what we've been studying, in Revelation chapter 14, starting in verse 9, it says, The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. What does the third angel do? It gives a warning. It gives a warning directly related to the nation beast that we've been studying from Revelation chapter 13. We need to understand that we've been called to give a warning in this world. And that warning tells us to pay close attention to the things that this nation, the United States of America, is actually doing. That's why in Testimonies volume 5, on page 451, it says, when our country shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican government, then we may know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan and that the end is near. Remember here, it doesn't say that these principles are going to be taken away, not even taken away by violence. It says that they're going to be repudiated. They're going to be mocked ignored. Look, a nation speaks by its laws. That's what we established in our second study. That's why it's so important for us to understand the role of the Supreme Court in Bible prophecy, because our nation speaks by the laws that it makes, but it also controls. And the way that a nation controls is the same as it's out, that is outlined here in Revelation chapter 13. It controls through its economic system. And so we've seen that the economic system has been created in such a way that you and I are placed into a position of extreme debt and indebtedness so that we would become dependent upon others. And that dependence is used as a lever of control over the population. An example of that is in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 17, not to buy and sell. And the control here of buying and selling then is determined by the laws of the land. An example of that is in the environmental movement, decisions of how we will live and a decision on how you will live being controlled by the state. That's why in Luke 21 verse 26, it says that men's hearts will be failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. The very earth is going to react to the sinfulness of mankind at this time. And yet man is not going to change their life to come into conformity with God's will. Instead, they're going to trade carbon. It's like trading sin. It's an unbelievable methodology that is being introduced into our world today. 
This is why in Isaiah chapter 24, verse 6, it says that the curse will devour the earth and they that dwell therein are desolate. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned and few men left. So we've seen up until now What is actually taking place? We've seen that a nation is born, that it speaks by its laws, that it controls by its economic policies. And now we are now looking at what will happen with the people of God at this time. Because religious liberty is being taken away as we speak right now. What is happening in this last great conflict before us? In order to understand how religious liberty gets taken away, we have to understand how it was established. What led to the establishment of religious liberty? Daubigny, in his History of the Protestant Reformation, says that Protestantism sets the power of conscience above the magistrate and the authority of the Word of God above the visible church. In the first place, It rejects the civil power in divine things and says with the prophets and apostles, we must obey God rather than men. It lays down the principles that all human teaching should be subordinate to the oracles of God. What allowed religious liberty to take place? What allowed religious liberty to take place was Protestantism. Protestantism led to the separation of church and state that the state had its realm and authority and the church has its realm and authority. And these two things are not to intertwine. The state is not to tell me how to worship. The state is not to tell me where to worship. The state is not to tell me what to worship. And the church is to remain out of the affairs of the state. These two things separated are what allowed for religious liberty to be born in this nation. That doesn't mean that the nation is without morals. In fact, John Adams said that our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. In order to understand our freedoms, including our religious liberties, we have to have a sense of morality. This is why the First Amendment in the Bill of Rights, passed in 1791, says that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. This here is the basic principle that religious freedom is that is based on. This Protestant notion that the state and the church are separated. And so all of these things are linked together. The establishment of religion, freedom of speech, peaceable assembly, are linked together. They cannot be separated. Once you try to take them apart, they all fall apart. And that is what is happening in our culture right now. The basic principle of religious liberty requires an educated people with the capacity to think and the freedom to be able to think. When I was growing up, I, I still was growing up in the communist period. Communism was still around in a great way. And when we were told about religious liberty being taken away, it was often done in that context, a very Orwellian context. You know, George Orwell in 1984 came up with this idea that was very popular because of communism, that religious liberties and other liberties were gonna be taken away from us by force, that a sinister government authority was going to come in and ban books and ban religion and ban and ban and ban and ban and make illegal, that that's what was gonna happen. And so you had this Orwellian model that came around where you've got 
like he wrote in 1984, this idea that the state is going to come in and take everything away from you. So I remember as a kid in church, they used to tell us that we should memorize Bible verses because they were going to come to us and take away our Bibles. And the only people who would know anything from scripture were the ones who memorized it. So we memorized our Bible verses. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that. You know, go ahead and and memorize it. Remember it, of course, hold it dear to your heart. But we were told to do this because a sinister force was going to come and take all of our Bibles away. That never happened. Religious liberty has not been taken away by force. Satan has already learned that lesson. During the Middle Ages, when he tried to use force to end liberties, freedoms, and the development of Protestant thought, it backfired terribly. The more violence that he tried to create, the more Protestantism grew. People wanted to be free. And so Satan learned that there is a much more effective way to get rid of religious liberty. It's not in Orwell's depiction in 1984. It's actually based on Aldous Huxley's depiction in Brave New World. In Brave New World, the society that he envisions in that novel that was so popular and that is still read by university students today, in his utopian society, everything was free, but truth had been so buried in irrelevant things that people lost a concept of what truth actually was. What is actually happening today? There's this really influential essay that was written, and I want to quote to you from it. It says, What Orwell feared were those who would ban books. What Huxley feared was that there would be no reason to ban a book, for there would be no one who wanted to read one. Orwell feared those who would deprive us of information. Huxley feared those who would give us so much that we would be reduced to passivity and egoism. Orwell feared that the truth would be concealed from us. Huxley feared that the truth would be drowned in a sea of irrelevance. Orwell feared we would become a captive culture. Huxley feared we would become a trivial culture, preoccupied with some equivalent of the feelies, the orgy-porgy, and the centrifugal bumble buppy. Which one of them was true? What has taken away religious liberty? It has not been force. It has not been somebody coming and taking your Bible away. Nobody has taken your Bible away. You know what has happened? So many books of irrelevance have been placed atop the Bible that we no longer appreciate the Word of God. I don't want you to get the wrong idea. I'm not opposed to technology. My, my laptop, my tablet, my, my phone, my watch, my house, they all talk to each other. I'm not opposed to technology. But we have come to the point where the Bible is no longer the Word of God. The Bible is an app on our smartphone. That's all it is. It's no longer the Word of God. And again, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that you can't have a Bible on your phone. I I hope that you do. I I have many on mine in all kinds of languages so that when I'm going somewhere, I have easy access to the Word of God. But the problem is that now that the Bible is just an app on your phone, we've surrounded the Bible with garbage. And having surrounded it with garbage, it has lost its place. It has lost its meaning. It has lost its relevance to the point where now these other tools have to take a preeminence. And somebody who wishes to speak of things that are scriptural needs to actually be told that they cannot do that anymore. It's offensive to read God's word. There is a new truth, you see, because I have my truth. 
truth is truth. I, I hate to break it to you, but truth is truth. But by making the truth subject to my own personal interpretation and removing myself from the word of God, religious liberty has been taken away much more effectively than if it had been taken away by force. This kind of confusion is shown within the prophecy. Let's look in Revelation chapter 14, verse 8. What's happening? There followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. What is happening? In our culture, we are becoming Babylon. What's Babylon in scripture? Great Controversy, page 381. The term Babylon is derived from Babel and signifies confusion. It is employed in scripture to designate the various forms of false or apostate religion. Do you know how we've lost religious liberty? By having it drowned in a sea of irrelevance. The Bible, the word of God, is no longer the word of God. It's now a book that we read. As a society, we have lost purpose. Many people wake up in the morning with absolutely no purpose in their life. They have become nothing more than worker bees, going through life, following the motions, without any understanding of how valuable they are to their creator. Do you understand that as a society, we've come to the point where we don't live anymore. We just watch other people as they live while we don't live. This is how religious liberty is taken away. By having us drowned in the lives of irrelevant individuals. My grandfather came from a small island uh, off the coast of Croatia. Uh, it's called Krk. Uh, specifically, he's from a place called Punat. And in that small town, there's a village, for a thousand years, they've done the same thing. For a thousand years, they fished and grow olives. That's all you can do on the island, pretty much, for a thousand years. You could go fishing or you could grow olives. That was about all you could do there. And there's this army that shows up there to the native inhabitants of the island. They were called Illyrians. And the army shows up there and tells these people, says to them, you are Venetians. And the people in Punat, they said, okay. And they fished and grew olives, right? And then this other army comes there. And the other army says to them, you are Hungarians. And the people said, okay. And they fished and grew olives. And then another army came there and said, you're Austro-Hungarians. And they said, okay. And they fished and grew olives. And then this army came there and said, you're Italians. And they said, okay. And they fished and grew olives. And another army came there and said, you're Serbians. And they said, okay. And they fished and grew olives. And then another army came there and they said, you're Nazis. They said, okay, and they fished and grew olives. And then another army came there and they said, you're communists. Well, communist was a little bit different because the communists took away all the fish and they took away all the olives. But in any case, the people kept on fishing and growing olives. And then another army came there and they said, you're Croatians. And my grandfather says, you know, now we're confused. We, we don't know anymore. Right? We are living in a time where the majority of people have become worker bees. They do not think, they do not expand their own ability to think. And instead, what they're doing is they're allowing other people to live for them while they watch other people live. This is how religious liberty is taken away. We send our children to the state schools so that the state school can indoctrinate our children. And we are seeing more and more a prohibition on parents teaching their children as if parents are disqualified from teaching their children morals, teaching their children that we need somebody else to come in and correct 
parents. So we send our children to indoctrination institutes. And I hear people telling me, you know, say, you know, my, my child, they're leaving the faith. They are getting confused by the things of this world. Well, I mean, if you sent your children to Babylon to be educated, why are you so shocked that they became little Babylonians? What did you think was going to happen when you sent them there? We send our children to indoctrination centers where they are taught by the state that religious liberty means no religion. They're told that religious liberty means freedom from religion, as opposed to what religious liberty actually is, which is freedom to practice your religion. And then these same children are Googleified, like most of us. Now again, as I said before, I'm not opposed to technology. I don't want you to think that I am. I have all these cool gadgets that help me do exactly what we're doing right now. But I want you to think about what is happening inside our culture right now. I'm getting older, but I remember when you used to have to go to the library to get a book. I remember that, uh, unless you bought it. You went to the library to get a book. Now, the cool thing about a library is that on your way to getting the book that you came there for, you pass by a lot of other books. And some of them catch your attention. They catch your eye. And so you read these other books as well. We don't do that anymore. Libraries are disappearing. And the few libraries that cities still maintain are basically places that people go to get free internet. We've taken the library and put it onto our devices. That has a great benefit. And the great benefit is that now you have access to all of these things. But the problem is that 99.99999% of what is available in this wonderful World Wide Web is error. Truth, actual truth, constitutes such a small, minuscule portion of what is there that it has become literally drowned in a sea of irrelevance. Exactly what Huxley said was going to happen to our society that has begun to love the technologies that actually oppress us. And think about this. When you're searching, you only search for something that you already want to find, which means that you're never going to find truth because you have a preconceived idea of what you want, so that is what you search for. Think about it. Why was Yahoo not successful? Bing. When was the last time you did a Bing search? When was the last time you did a Yahoo search? You don't do Yahoo search. Why not? Too complicated. On the Yahoo homepage, there was too much stuff. Do you know why Google won the search wars? Google won the search engine wars because Google has on its homepage one box. One box, nothing else. Clear, simple, one box. But the thing is, inside that one box, you're only gonna put things that you've already decided to look for which means that you're only going to be exposed to your preconceived ideas. You're not going to be exposed to truth. This is how religious liberty is taken away, by having it buried in such a way that it becomes impossible to actually find. Not only that, but we've given away our very lives to social media. We now have come to the point where we have these basically weapons of mass distraction that are taking away our capacity to think. We spend all of our time watching other people live. It's true. You can put Bible verses onto your Instagram account. And I applaud you for doing that. But it is such a small, minuscule portion of what is actually in your social media feed. The vast majority is garbage designed to distract you from truth. We now, after a little bit more than a decade, 
have as a society become addicted to social media. We cannot live without it. We can't live without it. Now, what happens when social media, the companies of which are corporations that need to make a profit and that are run by private individuals, they're not run by the state, they're not run by your church, Instagram, Facebook, even things like WhatsApp, all of them, all of them have the capacity to control their content. What happens when these private enterprises decide that what is truth is offensive to them and decides that they will not allow that to be available on their platforms anymore? As a society, we're completely addicted to these platforms. They are the sources of our news. They are the sources of our information. They are how we communicate one with another, even with our families. What happens when these platforms make a decision that your faith is offensive to them? And they will not allow you to share your faith. Religious liberty is taken away, not by force, but by being drowned in a sea of irrelevance. I've given this challenge many times. I challenge you to only use social media as much as you read the Word of God. It's a challenge. Try it for one week. And it doesn't work the other way. You can't say, uh, I was on Facebook for you know, this many minutes and then I'm going to read the Bible for this many minutes. No, it, it won't work that way because you'll never read that much of Scripture. It has to be the other way. Spend time in the study of God's Word. You spend time in the reading of God's Word and keep a timer you know, on your smartphone of how long you have read the Word of God. And then restrict your use of social media to just the same amount of minutes and see if you can follow that challenge. When I give this challenge to people, many of them will say, okay, well, I accept the challenge. And when I see them the next week, they tell me, no way, I could not do it. I could not do it. I can spend hours and hours and hours in my social media, but I cannot spend hours and hours in the reading of the word. Why? Because you have filled your brain with all this garbage to the extent that the Word of God has lost its value to you. This is how our religious liberties are taken away. Do you know who doesn't use these things? Do you know who doesn't listen to the music, watch the shows, or the films, or these so-called documentaries, or spend time in social media, do you know who doesn't do it? The families of the owners of this social media. I wanna read you from this article in the New York Times. It's fascinating. It says, most inhabitants of the overclass seem to know intuitively that these freewheeling scripts don't bear that much relationship to the way that successful, upwardly mobile people actually live and mate and marry. Okay, so pay attention here. What it's saying is that the people who actually produce this material, they understand that it's harmful. They understand that in order to be successful, you can't use these things. You can't live by these things. That's what they know. They instinctively know and teach their children that this stuff is garbage. They teach them that. Okay, now the article continues. The movies make college life seem like nonstop, beer-soaked dissipation, for instance. But actually, individuals attending four-year colleges and universities report some of the lowest levels of casual sex regardless of how casual sex is measured. So again, if you were inclined to view all of this suspiciously, you might look at the culture industry networks and production companies, magazines and music labels, and note that the messages it sends about sex are a kind of win-win for the class of people running it. They get to profit off various forms of exploitation directly because sex sells and shock value attracts eyeballs. 
And then they also reap benefits indirectly because the teaching they're offering to the masses, the vision of the good life, is one that tends to ratify existing class hierarchies by encouraging precisely the behaviors and choices that in the real world make it hard to rise and thrive. Do you understand what the author is saying here? The ones who produce the content that you have based your life around, they understand that this content is garbage. They understand it. They don't use it. They don't participate in it because they understand that by living the life that they're portraying, you can't be successful. You will end up whatever little means you're able to get from your employment, you will end up spending it on things that are irrelevant. They know that. And so they have created a system that's perfect because they don't participate in these things, but you do. You lose your freedoms, your liberties. You're willing to give away your freedom of thought to these corporations who then control how you will think and whether you will be happy or not. You know, Facebook was able to do a study and show that they could directly impact people's happiness by controlling what showed up in their feed. That's amazing. The article continues. In this sense, one might suspect our cultural elites of being a little bit like the Silicon Valley parents who send their kids to computer-free schools. They don't mind pushing the moral envelope in the shows they greenlight and the songs they produce because they're confident that their own kids have the sophistication required to regard Robin Thicke and Miley Cyrus as amusements rather than role models the social capital required to keep the culture's messages at arm's length. Do you understand? We are living in a time where our religious liberties are being taken away because we no longer have the capacity to think. Religious liberty can only exist in a society that is based on individuals who think for themselves. We've decided to give away our liberty to think to somebody else. Not only that, we've given them our entire lives, the photographic evidence of everything that we have done. To the extent that you can't have a meal without telling the whole world what it is that you ate. Every single thing being controlled and dictated, not by you, but by somebody else. In this environment, religious liberty cannot exist. The end of religious liberty, the fall of religious liberty, is not a violent event. It is taking place right now because individuals no longer have the capacity to think and dialogue with one another. That's why our society is coming to the point where it is so polarized. Because those who desire to actually think about things can't. They're not allowed to. Because the very words that they said hurt me. And we now need to have safe spaces where the truth cannot be allowed to enter into that safe space. Imagine the very notion that is being brought about in our culture and in our times. While the people directing these safe spaces know how ludicrous they are, that the people who have placed themselves there have lost the capacity to think for themselves. This is the new truth that we are living in. What are God's people supposed to do during this time? Like you and me. What can we do during this time? Ours is not a new truth. Ours is an old truth. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 58, the prophet states very clearly, Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Right now, you and I, even in the midst of this confusion, 
we have a duty and obligation to share the truth of God's word. We need to cry aloud. We need to spare not. People need to know that the truth is still the truth. It's not a new truth. It's an old truth. Verse 12 says, And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. You and I have been called by God to give this old message, this old truth in this world. We're going to need to cry loud because the majority of people have lost their capacity to think. They're drowned in a sea of irrelevance. And in these last moments of truth, a contest is taking place. In Prophets and Kings, page 625, it says it much more clearly than I can. Between the laws of men and the precepts of Jehovah will come the last great conflict of the controversy between truth and error. Upon this battle, we are now entering. A battle not between rival churches contending for the supremacy, but between the religion of the Bible and the religions of fable and tradition. Our contest, this final contest, is not going to be a contest between churches. It's going to be a contest between truth and error. That's what the contest is going to be based on. The ability of an individual to think is what will allow them to make a real decision in this great final conflict. The statement continues. The agencies which have united against truth are now actively at work. God's holy word, which has been handed down to us at so great a cost of suffering and bloodshed, is little valued. There are few who really accept it as the rule of life. Infidelity prevails at an alarming extent, not in the world only, but in the church. Many have come to deny doctrines which are the very pillars of the Christian faith. The great facts of creation as presented by the inspired writers, the fall of man, the atonement, the perpetuity of the law, these all are practically rejected by a large share of the professedly Christian world. Thousands who pride themselves on their knowledge regard it as an evidence of weakness to place implicit confidence in the Bible and a proof of learning to cavil at the scriptures and to spiritualize and explain away their most important truths. I could not say it better than these words that I read to you. That's the world that we're living in. It has now become fashionable to mock God's word and the truth. And yet you and I have been called to cry aloud and spare not. But only people who have read the word can share the word. And so right now, as never before, I call upon you to be found often in the reading of God's word. Study this word. Let it be life to you. Let it be a lamp to guide your way. As you know God's word for yourself, you will have a message to share. You will be able to cry aloud and spare not. The world needs this message because their ability to think has been taken away. Let that not be your case. This is why the Apostle Paul said those words to Timothy. Don't be ashamed. Let's read it again. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12. For the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. This world will mock you. They will use this mockery to shut down your religious liberties. But you have the capacity to think, to reason, and as a result, you have found yourself in the study of God's word, have seen its beauty, have been convicted of truth, and you have nothing to be ashamed of. Share the gospel truth 
as never before with all who are willing to hear it so that they too can be able to have the same experience of beauty in truth, knowing that that which you commit to the Lord, that personal relationship that you have with him, he will guard until that day. And so I'm praying that this will be your experience while all the liberties and freedoms are being taken away. Yours will never be taken away because your freedom of religion is guaranteed to you by God himself. Let's pray together that this would be our experience. I invite you to bow your head together with me. Our Father which art in heaven, we thank you, Lord, that you've given us the freedom to be able to think and reason for ourselves. We thank you, Lord, that we have your word given to us. We thank you that we still are able to study it in relative peace. And we recognize, Lord, that this peace is quickly being taken away. And so we ask that you would help us, Lord, in these last few remaining moments of liberty to be able to share the word with others as it has never been shared before. We ask, Lord, for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit upon us, that the latter rain would be given to us and that we might go out and give the loud cry, the last message of warning to this world. We ask these things, Lord, not because we're worthy, but because we ask them in Jesus' precious name. Amen. It's been my pleasure to study God's word together with you, and I hope and pray that you will spend this week studying God's word and join us again next week as we continue our study of Revelation chapter 13. I ask you to have, if you have any questions, please go ahead and write them in the comments below or message me directly as some of you have done. Like, subscribe, and invite others to be able to share this truth together with them. May God bless each and every one.